a hand clap of praise, a shout of triumph. God, you're still God. God, you're 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 God. You're always going to be God. You're always going to be God. Wow. I have a prophetic word for you, and then I'm going to bring a message that's also prophetic in nature. And I stayed up to 4 o'clock this morning working on it and um, worked on it most of the day. Wrote it, was inspired by the Holy Ghost prior to the news breaking this morning about the low court's decision. Um, I'm not going to call them Supreme Court. You know, I have all respect for the law and for judges, but respect be all loined is something you got to oin. You don't get an honorary, <laughs> never mind. I'm not a rebellious person, but I got a word here in a moment. And, um, and it's a word in season that God knew we were going to need tonight. And I really felt very strange, Pastor. Not for the first time. I'm one of them weird Christians too, I hope. And I stayed with it and I said, God, I have all these other really good ideas that would be really a lot simpler to preach and a lot less likely that I'd butcher it somehow. He said, no, that's not the idea. This is the idea. So I'm going to give you that word in just a moment. But before I do, I've got to prophesy to you. Prophesy to the wind. Speak to the Holy Ghost. Declare under divine inspiration to the Holy Spirit what to do. The back up the word of God. So I'm doing this under divine inspiration. It's commanded by the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8, how many of you know that the offering's already been taken? That I'm not going to get any more. And I'm going to tell you something else. I'm going to testify about this pastor. Everything he does is first class. Puts you in a nice motel, gives you the best food to eat, and he's always added to the offering. And for an evangelist that lives for 35 years by faith, not knowing what your check's going to be week from week, that is a blessing to serve under a man like that. That blessing. It, it, it is a blessing. And we all know that the Bible says, given it shall be given unto us, what? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give unto your bosom. I want to see the hand of every person here that that scripture has held true in your life, that people have blessed you that you didn't even, that don't even like you. <laughs> then the word of God also further goes on to say that if you're a giver, that he will receive it as a sacrifice, as a sweet smell, and he will himself supply all your need according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus, his son. But I want to tell you, I have a double prophecy for this choice tonight because you've gone far beyond anything that even God required, and you did it out of a heart of sacrifice and love because you love God, you love God's servant, you love your choice, and this is a prophecy. Throw your hands up and say, I receive it as a prophetic word. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does it, or woman does it, or teenager or young poison, that same shall that same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bound or free. So God's got a plan to bless you through other men. And besides that plan, God says anything you do for the kingdom of God, the Lord himself is going to do that very same thing back at you. When you help other souls get saved, when you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. Somebody give the Lord a hand clap. Whatever thing you do, whatever thing you do, whatever thing, you may be seated. Father God, you spoke to me earlier today to speak this blessing. I didn't know about that one just now, but I speak it and receive it myself. But also I speak this one. Father God, I pray that you would bless them indeed. That you would expand their coast. That this choice would have an impact on the entire world. That your hand will always be with them. 
that you will keep them from evil, that it may not grieve them. I declare this in the name of Jesus. And everyone that receives that prophecy, throw your hands in the air and say, I receive it, and give the Lord a hand clap of praise as it's already done. As it's already done. Tonight I'm going to be preaching from a story in the Bible that probably just about anybody in this room that's been saved any length of time has heard the story, has probably shared the story. I would even suppose that most of the children, and how about our children this week? Haven't they been awesome right up here on the front row praising and worshiping God? Aren't you proud of our kids that they love God enough to come up and praise God and be Pentecost when Pentecost isn't cool? Someone give the Lord a hand clap of praise. But I'm going to share from a story that probably most kids in this room could tell you about from Sunday school or children's church and because it's such a thrilling, exciting, exhilarating, and, and of course, it's in the Bible. So it's not evangelistically speaking. It's that and so much more. But also, I, I've preached, I don't know how many times, from these scriptures and around these scriptures about this account. In fact, I mentioned it Sunday morning with no intention whatsoever of tying it back together tonight and God putting the final bow on this thing. How many of you know whenever God speaks to you, it's a gift? That it's a gift from God. Why? Because God's word cannot return to him void, but it always accomplishes in what? The hearer, what God sent it to do. How many of you know that thank be to God that no matter what this world does, if you make up your mind that you're going to seek the face of God, God will find a way to heal your land. God will find a way to bless you no matter what goes on around you. But tonight I have a very powerful message, and little did I know of the prophetic nature that it was going to take on. You see, God is about to bring journey into a new vision. And all the other ministries represented here tonight, he's bringing you into a new vision. Now, if what I preach for some reason, because the anointing does not guarantee intelligence, I would never get up and deliberately mislead people. But I'll be honest, I've made mistakes preaching. I've preached stuff that I thought was absolutely right, only to find out later that I was operating on very little real knowledge. Then why would God honor it? Because God knew that I wasn't doing it. I was doing it the best I could. And so if the vision I share with you tonight does not line up with the pastor's vision or your pastor's vision, then I'm wrong. They're not wrong. Because they're your pastor, and their vision for that church is greater than any visiting minister could possibly be. And I only have authority because I'm under authority. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. And God is about to bring this church into a glorious new season of the supernatural. And he does that by revealing his word, and then we receive his word, and we begin to meditate on it, and then the Holy Spirit touches and waters that seed, and it produces fruit in our lives, 30, 60, 100 fold, not, not just financially, every area. And so tonight's word is a very special word. And I want to talk a little bit about that great transference. When Elijah, you know, when they crossed over the Jordan, and they crossed over the Jordan River, and when they crossed over the Jordan onto the Jericho side. Someone throw your hands up and say, I don't want to be in Jericho but I want to be on the Jericho side of the river. I don't want to stay on the other side of the river. I don't want to stay connected to Egypt. I want to cross over into the promised land. And I know what some folks are saying. Hey, but Brother John, there's a big old wall over there, and there's some giants over there. But, oh, yeah, that's true. But I've also got a report that that land's everything that God said it was, and God's over there, and he's going to bear with me. I know it's oikey joiky. And there was this transference from Elijah or Elijah to Elijah. And we know that he did receive the double portion. And, and, and I want to talk about the moment. If I, I want to lead to that moment because nothing in the Bible is just there. God builds things the right way. Any contractors here? Line upon line. 
precept upon precept here a little there a little the foundation's got to be right the framework's got to be right because if the foundation's wrong and the framework's wrong it doesn't matter how good the house looks the first bad storm comes it's going down how many are glad that god built you on solid ground tonight so i want to talk a little bit about that transference of that that the power of god from elijah to elisha that was so powerful that now Byron God, through the man of God, is going to do twice as many miracles as he did through Elijah, which is pretty impressive when you look at Elijah, how he called fire out of heaven. The, well, I won't go in there. You all know that part of the story. But we need to understand that the exact location that this happened was not coincidental. When he crossed over that Jordan onto the Jericho side, and Elijah is taken, and then Elijah receives his mantle for ministry. I can't give you an anointing. God anoints you. I can pray gifts on you. I can, I, you know, Paul wrote Timothy, he said, stir up that gift of God is in you by the laying out of hands. But I can't give you anything that God don't want you to have in your life. But this mantle was God's plan for Elijah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I know it's a little hoiky-joiky. And it happens at the Jordan River, and it happens as they cross over into Jericho. And, and, and guys, it's so kind of cool because that location, when this happens, actually, when Elijah is actually taken, in my mind, if you want to live in the promised land, they're on the wrong side of the Jordan River. But you see, the moment Elijah receives the mantle, he crosses back onto the right side of the river into the promises of God. How many want to learn the principles tonight and how to walk into the full promises of God into the promised land of the Lord? Somebody raise your hands right now. How many know that America, the very future of our country, is at stake tonight and the only hope this country has is a Holy Ghost revival? But how many of you know that God still sends revival? That God still God? I said God still God. In, in 2 Kings chapter 2, voice 14 and 15, turn in the person next to you and say, cut Brother Johnson slack. <laughs> he did the best he could. He stayed up as long as he could. But this is fresh out of the oven of heaven. So it's going to be hoiky-joiky, but it's a word from God. How many would rather have something be hoiky-joiky and have it be fresh manna than it be real polished and it just be something that's, you know... Well, anyway, in 2 Kings chapter 2, voice number 14. And give our poor poison a tremendous hand back there for, for helping us. Do we, did I give you that? No? Do we, yeah, do we got it? Or do I need to read it? Okay. Okay. Give them a hand. You know, that's a tough job. The only time you get noticed is when something's missing. <laughs> And he took the man of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? I have to be very honest with you today. If I went solely by the natural report, just the things that our country has done this week, I would be a very discouraged person. But you see, I know I've also seen in the midst of it I've seen the Lord, and he's high, and he's lifted up, and his glory fills the temple. The God of Elisha is alive and well in Eva, Alabama tonight. Someone shout, alive and well. And he took the man of Elijah that fell from him and smote the water and said, where is the God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. Now, understand that the prophet is, in my, if you're going to walk into the promised land, he's on the wrong side of the river. And Elijah took him there deliberately, and hopefully through the wisdom and the ability of God, I'll share to you why he's there in order to walk in this new anointing. And, 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 and a, a new, how many believe that God's going to give us a new vision? And they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. Voice of all, he's standing at the Jordan River. 
if you're going to enter into the promised land, the first thing you got to understand is there are going to be some things you're going to have to overcome. There's going to be some things that will try to discourage you because the word Jordan means one that pulls under or one that pulls down. If you're going to enter into the promised land of God, you've got to go get past and get over those things that are pulling you down and pulling you under through the, oh, somebody shout it. And you can, you can through God's mantle. And they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. Notice voice 15, if you would. Do you got, the, or, do we got that one? Yes. And when the sons of the prophets, which were in view of Jericho, saw him, he doesn't just cross the Jordan back into the promised land, but he crosses at the very place known as Jericho, approximately 15 miles from Jerusalem. All these places I'm going to talk about tonight are very close together because they're all visited in one day by foot. And when the sons of the prophets were at the view of Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah does rest on Elijah. We know that that is the power of the Holy Ghost. And it was manifesting through Elijah now, had it did, had the way it did through Elijah. How many of you would like to have a double portion, not for yourself, but that you can minister to the others. How many know that the only hope this nation has is a double portion of the Holy Ghost that come upon the body of Christ once again? I know it's okay, joy key, but bear with me. And they came to meet him, and they bowed themselves to the ground before him. In this, they're not worshiping, but they are submitting to his authority as prophet. Now, when this took place, this takes place at at Jericho, at the River Jordan. The double portion mantle has been, the request has been, been honored and has been poured out on Elisha. He smites the water, God parts it, and he walks back into the promised land. Get where I'm coming from. But before he could do that, there was a journey. God took him on a journey so that he would have a greater understanding and that we would have a greater understanding of why we're asking for a double portion and what we can expect to happen in our lives through the double portion. To understand that, go to 2 Kings chapter 2, voice 1 and 2. And it came to pass when the Lord would take Elijah up into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elijah from Gilgal. Now, this is very significant. Notice voice number 2. And Elijah said to Elijah, Terry here, I pray thee, you don't have to come to revival every night. You don't have to participate in worship every night. You don't have to pour of yourself out like you have every single night. I'm grateful. In other words, the prophet says to him, I'm going to go on. I'm going to go on to Bethel, but you can stay here and, and, and you don't have to come. But notice, guys, if you want a double portion, you got to be that person that's willing to go beyond what God's asking you to do, that you're willing to go beyond what you've been taught, that you're willing to go that, oh, some, how many of you don't understand what I'm saying? And Elijah said to Elijah, Terry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. I've been sent by God to Bethel. You can stay here and tarry if you want to. But notice what Elijah said unto him. As the Lord liveth, as my soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Now bear with, bear with me. In this process between here and verse 14, you have the request for the double portion. Had he tarried there in Gilgal, he would have never been able to ask the prophet for a double portion. He would have never seen the prophet go. In other words, he would have never received the double portion had he tarried where he could have. In other words, there's a place in our walk with God that God wants us to do it because we love him. God wants us to go that extra mile because we're so hungry for him that we're afraid to take our eyes off the preacher that we might miss something. We're afraid to miss one service. Now bear with me, it's hoiky joiky. But notice they left Gilgal and they went to Bethel. Why is that? Because if you're going to operate in a double portion, if you're going to possess the promised land of God, you cannot do it from Gilgal. You've got to, you've got to leave that place 
and you got to go somewhere else. And they didn't just leave Gilgal and just wander out aimlessly, hoping that the Lord would get a hold of them, but they left with a precise purpose. They had a, they, they had a, I don't know if they draw out a map like I do, but they had, they knew where they were going. When they left Gilgal, I'm going to Bethel. And the reason why this has to happen is the word Gilgal means a wheel. It means something that just goes in a circle. In other words, anybody here besides me, you don't know how much I needed journey this week. You don't know what a joy it's been to feel and experience what I experienced this week. Iron does sharpen iron. And the best of us, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves getting in a rut, just going in the same old circle all the time, always moving, always going, but never getting anywhere. So the prophet says, you know, he knows that he's going to ask for a double portion. He knows that he's fixing to go. Everyone knows that voice one said it. He knows. So he says, I've got to go to Bethel. I know that I'm fixing to go to heaven and be with my Lord, and I'm going to go alive. And, and, and so I've got to get to Bethel. And, and see, and so I've got to get out of Gilgal. I've got to get out if I want to enter that double portion season. If I want to enter that new vision where you're not always talking about it. You're not always believing, but now you're receiving. How many of you want to enter that place in God where you're living in the promised land of God? How many want to enter that place where you're in the double portion? Then you got to get out of that thing of just going in a circle. Get out of that rut. And, and guys, it's, if we're not careful... It can happen to anybody, and, and we'll find ourselves just going in circles and going in circles, and no matter how much God is pouring out his spirit all around us, if we don't personally get out of Gilgal, no matter how much God wants to pour out that double portion, we won't be able to receive it because we're always just going in that same old circle. But notice where they went. They didn't, I, I want to see the hand. Anybody here ever found yourself in a spiritual rut? Anybody here ever found yourself doing all the right things, getting all the wrong results? Have you, have you ever had a time in your life where you just desperately need a refreshing from God? Let me see your hand if you fall in that category. Then this message tells you exactly what to do. He didn't just leave going in a circle, the same old, same old, same old, same old, same old, but he went somewhere because if your life is in a rut, if you're on a spiritual battle, you're not going to get that deliverance. You're not going to get that double portion just anywhere. you got to have your mind made up when all hell breaks loose in your life that I'm going somewhere. I'm going to get to Bethel. Why is that so important? Because in Genesis chapter 28, voice number 11, everybody wave at me. Say, this is mine. Say, this is for me. If nobody else can, guys, I want to ask you, friend, do you want to be where you are one year from now, right now? Do you, guys, do you want to be in the same place you are right now, a year from now? I don't think there's a single person in this room. How many of you want to experience more of God in your life a year from now than you've been? How many want to enter a new double portion of, of time? I know it's like you're doing, but God keeps telling me to say this to you. Do you really want to be? I don't know where you're at, friend, but God's asking you to examine yourself. Do you really want to be a year from now where you are tonight? Because if you don't make a decision, if you don't make a decision to get out of Gilgal and get somewhere, you're going to find yourself going in that same circle of depression and the... And notice where he went. He went to Bethel. And he lighted upon a sweating place and tarried there all night. How many of you have ever been in a season where you were down a little bit? See your hands. Any of you ever been in a season where at the end of the month, there just wasn't enough money to cover all the bills? Come on now, am I talking to anybody? Have you ever been where, you know, you didn't even have a nickel or two nickels to rub together? Gods, I've been in some tough spots. But I ain't got to this place yet. This guy's so busted 
that he can't even afford a motel room and he can't even afford a decent pillow. Are you hearing me? And he lit upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillow. He was so broke and so busted, he didn't even have a backpack to put his head on. He had to just get a bunch of rocks, wrap them up in some clothes or something, and boom, <laughs> laid his head on him. And so he's at a bad place. Not only that, he's running from his brother Esau that wants to kill him and will kill him if he got him at this point. And he put them for his pillow and laid down in that place to sleep. Someone say, God's speaking to me. Notice the next voice. How many want a double portion? How many want to enter the promised land? How many believe that God wants to take you into the promised land into a double portion? Then we've got to get out of Gilgal, and we've got to head somewhere to Bethel. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up upon the oith, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascended and descended. Brother Joey, Bishop, I've never understood this, but I know it to be true. There are just some places where God just pours, his presence is richer and greater. And I'm telling you, you may not see it, but there's a ladder coming right out of heaven right now. And it's right smack dab in the middle of this choice in Eva, Alabama. You may not see it right now, but there's angels ascending and descending. Somebody shout hallelujah. They're bringing, they're bringing stuff to you from God and bringing stuff from you to God. And he dreamed a dream, and behold, a ladder was set up on the oith, and the top of it reached into heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascended and descended. This is not fantasy. This is not someone's imagination. This is a supernatural spiritual vision of God. Notice the next voice, please. And behold, the angel stood, or behold, the Lord stood above it. Not only does he see this ladder with angels descending and ascending, but he sees God himself standing at the top of this ladder over this little wilderness place that as far as we know, there's only one voice in there, him. And he's so down and out, he's got to use a rock to be his pillow. But yet, God said, I have, you have, oh, somebody shout hallelujah. God said to him, you have found such favor with me. I'm going to open up my heavens, and I'm going to let you see something that most people will never see. Let me tell you something. How many sense right now that the heavens are open above this place, that there's angels descending and ascending? And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father. God stands tonight at the top of this ladder with the heavens opened up. And he's saying to Eva, Alabama, and to every choice in this nation that will listen, don't be afraid, don't be shook up, for I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father. I'm still God, and I have not changed. I always will be God. And I am the Lord God of it. I don't understand this, Pastor. But when I first got saved, I didn't know I was greener than grass. Couldn't read, didn't know nothing about God, didn't know nothing about church, didn't know how to act. So I watched people that went to church that I thought were veterans, and whatever they did, I did. If they went to dance, and I went to dance. And, hey, in a white. I said, no, bear with me. And I don't know where these people came from, but I was this guy running from organized crime, people wanting to whack me, coming off drugs and facing 21 years in prison, and this singing group shows up. They just showed up. I ain't never seen them since. Never saw them before that. And they sang a song. And I was so dumb about God, I didn't know nothing. So I listened to them sing. And this is what they sang. He's God in Alabama. He's God in Tennessee. He's God up there in heaven. And he's God all over me. I know that God is God, and he always will be God. He's God on the platform. He's God back at that door. He's God all over this floor. I know that God is God, and he always will be God. That, will, that has not changed. And God, last night, before I knew anything about the decision today, said, I want you to go to my people and tell them that I'm God and not to be afraid of what the Supreme Court's done. Just come out from amongst them. Don't have nothing to do with it because I'm God. 
And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, the God of Isaac, and the land whereupon thou lieth. To thee I will give it, the very promised land that Elijah is going to go into. And to thy seed, notice the next voice, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the oint, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the oint be blessed. God saying, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Jacob. I'm the God of Simon Peter. I'm the God of Apostle Paul. I'm the God of prophecy. I'm the God that made the promise. And I'm the God that tells you right now that I'm still God. At two. Mm. And my promises to bless through you are no less true right now than it was last night. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. Do you understand? No court, no man, no government can stop God from being God. And it's a bad thing to try. Notice voice 14. Oh, there it is. And, and next voice 15. And behold, I am with thee, Everybody raise your hands. My promises are still true. I will still bless through the churches that are sheep and not goats. I am still with thee, and I will keep thee in all the places whither thou goest. No matter how bad the persecution gets on Christians in this last day, I'm going to be with you. And if you find yourself in a jailhouse in the midnight hour, I'll rock the jailhouse. Oh, somebody shout hallelujah. You put your hand down. God's speaking. How many feel like God's speaking? And he said, and I will bring thee again into this land, and I will bring thee, thee your seed again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. This promise that Elijah is saying, I want a double portion. He doesn't realize that the plan of God says, yeah, I'm going to give you this entire land and nobody, there's not enough ISIS, there's not enough Muslims, there's not enough devils from hell to stop you from getting this land, but they're going to try. So I want you to know that I'm with you. And if you need a double portion, you can have a double portion if that's what you need. But you see, notice if you please, I know it's wicky joiky and everybody say it's okay. Good. Oh, thank you. Voice 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. Oh, I heard the news today. How could we be so vile as a people? Oh, this world has lost its mind. People are killing one another right and left. Oh, but I how, can I, how did I not know that the Lord was in this place and I knew it not? So in the midst of all the bad news, God is still in the place. Yeah. Notice verse 17. Come on, somebody. And he, he, and he was afraid and said, oh, how dreadful this place, this place. This is none other but the house of God. And this is the very portal to heaven. Notice voice 18. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillar and set it upon a pillar for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. Voice 19. And he called the name of the place Bethel. By the name of that city was called Luz at the voice. The word Bethel means the house of of God. So when you make up your mind that you're tired of walking in circles and you're tired of being in a rut, I've got a suggestion to you. Come out of Gilgal and get yourself back to Bethel. Get back to the house of God. Get back to where it all started. Get back to where you got saved. Get... How many remember when you got saved 
and you had such a fear of God that when God said, do this, this, and this, you just obeyed instantly without any hesitation. How many remember when you first got saved that you couldn't wait for the preacher to start preaching because you knew that God was going to talk to you? God's saying, when the devil tries to bring you in a rut, get out of that place called Gilgal and get back to the house of God. That's important, saints. Because in Genesis 35, voice 5, and I'm just touching on this, and, and they journeyed. Jacob's boys had whacked some guys for raping their sister. The only problem is they whacked some guys from a very bad tribe that outnumbered them like a 1,000 to 1. And Jacob gets a little nervous that if the Canaanites decide to kill us, we're few in number, and they're great in number. So the man of God goes to seeking God. And this is what happened after he sought the Lord. They started traveling, and they started going somewhere. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities around about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. I've come to tell you, that this is just the beginning. The fighters of God's work, the fighters of God's kingdom are going to intensify the attack. They're going to threaten you. They're going to tell you. They're going to annihilate you. But I've got news for you that if we will find our way back to where our walk with God started, back to where we met God for the first time, back to that altar where God baptized us in the Holy Ghost, back to that place where the Word of God became true, to, back to that place where our body got healed, then God says, we will walk out of that place with such an anointing on you that the enemy will be in terror of you. You will be terrified by the enemy. Are you enjoying this? It's a prophetic weight. Now let's drop down to voice 15 for time's sake. And Jacob called the name of the place where God sp spake with him, Bethel or the house of God. So the first thing the prophet says, you can have a double portion, but you gotta go, I'm gonna go back to Bethel. And what he's saying to you and I is we can have a double portion, but we gotta go back to where our relationship started with God. We got to go back to when we got saved. We got to go back to that glorious, are you hearing what I'm trying to say? We got to get back to the house of God and go back to where God spoke to us. Oh, guys, the nation's in this mess because there's a lot of churches that started out at Bethel. But somewhere along the line, they got away from the veil, ended up in Gilgad. God's not talking to them anymore, and they don't even realize what they're doing wrong. Are you, is this making, is you enjoying this? But now it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop a Bethel. We got to get back to the house of God. Then the prophet says to the other prophet, Elijah says to Elisha, now I'm at Bethel. We've left Gilgal behind. We're out of the rut. We went back, and we stayed in that altar till we had a fresh encounter with God. And God spoke to us again. Now I've got to go to Jericho. Now why does he go to Jericho? I have a promise from the Lord. Let me see your hands. How many want this? How many know we desperately live in an age where we've got to hear God? We've got to hear God. So you go back to Bethel. Some of them say, I'm going back, and I'm going to have a fresh encounter with God. Let me tell you, and I'm not talking about Faircrest Drive, but the last few revivals prior to this one, Pastor, I, I preached, and I gave everything I had, but it was like preaching to corpses, and it was, it, it, you could just sense the rejection and the, 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 of the Holy Ghost and the move of God and a prejudice against a spirit-filled Christian, and you're supposedly in a spirit-filled church. And I have to admit to you, man, it drained me. And I felt all baked up. And all of a sudden, I came in the journey. And some dudes are up here. And some people are up here. And next thing I know, and I got, I got back. I got back 
I went back to Bethel. I went back to where my walk with God began in the first place. And I found out that no matter what the devil's doing, that God I saved me 35 years ago, he's the same God today. He's still sitting on the floor. How many want a prophecy from the Lord? Joshua chapter 1, voice number 1. Good place to start, one and one. Now this happens at a place called Jericho. And this is really kind of cool. Everybody say, kind of cool. Some say it's really kind of cool. And it says, now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, voice two. He didn't say voice two, I said first. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan. Understand something. He went back to Jericho right at the bank of the Jordan. He said, now, man of God, I want you to go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I did give to them, not during Moses' day, all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The very thing I spoke in Genesis 28, you're inheriting now. 400 plus years later. How many evil pharaohs? How many wicked kings came along during those 400 some odd years? How many years of bondage? My, thou and all the people in the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Someone shout hallelujah. Notice voice three. Guys, I'm doing good. How many want a prophetic word? How many want a devil portion? How many want the promised land? How many are not ready to give up on this country? I said, how many are not ready to give up on this country? How many are not ready to give up on this country? Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread. I'm not in rebellion. But God didn't say that to the Supreme Court. God said that to believers. Every place your foot treads, that I have given unto you. As I said unto Moses, this is one nation that was founded under God by godly men and women hundreds of years ago, birthed by a supernatural outpouring of the Holy Ghost, and God saying to the choice, the real choice, the double portion choice, I send you back across this Jordan. Don't let the news today pull you down or pull you under. I want you to cross over this Jordan and everywhere you set your feet. My God, someone say this is prophetic. Not perfect. <laughs> Voice four. <laughs> and from the wilderness of this Lebanon, even unto the great river and the river Euphrates and all the land of the Hittites and all the other rites and kites, and unto the great sea towards the going down of the sun west shall be your coast. I don't care what kind of treaties are cut. This was God's covenant. Yeah. And it ain't going to change. Yeah. Notice voice five. Then shall not... There shall not any man be able to stand. Everybody raise your hands. Before this news broke today, God, my granddaughter watched me stay up all night with my earmuffs on so I wouldn't be distracted writing this message. And God said to tell you, don't stand there and take it. Everywhere you set your foot, you have the authority to take this land back by and help And then it said, well, what if the devil tries to stop me? Well, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee, Bishop Coots. So shall I be with thee, Journey Choice. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Nothing strange. Nothing. Voice number six. Come on now. Come on, somebody shout. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give to them. This country does not belong to the devil. It does not belong to carnal people. This nation belongs to the children of God. Don't belong to goats. Belongs to the sheep. You don't lead the goats to green pastures. <laughs> Voice seven, you guys are so cool. All I got to do 
is only be thou strong and very courageous. That means you're going to get some things are going to happen that would scare you. That thou mayest avoid to do according. Why do I have to be brave? Because the devil's going to get me? No. Why do I have to be brave? Because some sinner man's going to get me? No. This is why I got to be brave. That thou mayest deserve to do according to all the law. You're going to stand up for the truth, and goats ain't going to like it. I'm not worried about what the world does, because the world is going to be the world. Your property, which, Mo, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Well, Brother John, can we be a little bit flexible? Can we be reasonable and negotiate just a tad bit here? <laughs> I'm talking about what you order for dinner. I'm not talking about where you're going to go out and eat. I'm not talking about your desert later. I'm talking about obeying God's word. <laughs> Turn not from the right hand or the left. That's pretty serious, right? And, and that thou mayest pro Whoa. Wait a minute. He's not running this by the Congress. He's not running this by the Supreme Court. He's telling you, just do what you know is right. Obey my laws, walk in my laws, and everywhere you set your foot, the devil don't want you knowing it, but you're taking back ground for the kingdom of God. Oh, and by the way, by the way, if you do this, if you do this, someone shout hallelujah. If you do this, thou may prosper, that thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou goest. Thus saith the Lord, if the Lord could bring down the walls of Jericho, whack 32 kings and their army to give them the promised land, I submit to you tonight, that same God can prosper you and prosper me wherever we go. You guys are being really cool. You, you don't understand. A prophetic word is scary because you have to be correct. I mean, absolutely. You're not preaching from head knowledge. You're preaching, thus saith the Lord. Voice 8. I didn't give it to you, did I? Wow. Let there be verse 8. This, <laughs> this book of the law, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest deserve to do according to all that is written therein, for then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Do you understand? Nothing and nobody can stop the church of God that's walking in this book, that's living in this book. Nothing can stop you. Nothing. 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 Walk in my book and you're going to be successful. Walk in my book and I won't forsake you. Yeah. Now, sit down for just a moment. We're going to hurry, though. No, no, no. This is good. This is good. Voice 9. Have not I commanded thee? Have I not commanded me, what? Be strong and good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Can I tell you, when my wife ran in the room almost in tears and told me the news this morning, first hour or so, I was sick to my stomach. i am just be honest with you. I was sick. I wanted to upchuck my Wheaties. I said, and I, I, I actually got on her. And so don't ever wake me up and tell me something like that again, unless the house is on fire, because it can wait an hour until I wake up. Because I, I knew I couldn't go back to sleep with that on my mind. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whatsoever thou goest. 
And if you've got to come up and stand and say, thus saith the Lord, and some people that identify themselves as Christians come against you, and if, don't worry, I'm going to go with you wherever you go. And if you have to stand before the Supreme Court and they come in here and tell me and him we got to do gay marriages and say if we don't do it, they're going to arrest us, well, guess what? There's going to be a revival break out in the jailhouse. Because... Lock me up, throw away the key, and at midnight, me and Brother Joey, we're going to have some choice. And then God is going to shake that place. And then God is going to throw up on I got to be balanced here. I'm almost done. Really, I'm getting hungry. Well, what if the devil tries to stop me? Well, let me assure you, he will try to stop you. But the silly thing on the devil's part, he already knows the outcome if you walk in faith. He said, what? He said, Brother John, I believe what you just told me, but you're telling me the devil believes that? Yeah. Joshua chapter 2. I stayed up all night doing this. Voice number 10 and 11. For we, now wait a minute, this ain't just a sinner. That's a hooker. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, he without sin cast the first stone. And I got a terrible background. Those of you that know my testimony know that. But she's not just talking to a person don't go to church that's a good moral poison. This is a hooker. And she had more faith in God. Now, I'm going to show you something powerful here. This is so important. Everybody say it's important. Because I, I got a feeling that a lot of people today got so shook up by the news, they're stuck in Gilgad. I think they're stuck. I think the church, now listen to this. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. I'm hurrying. And when ye did, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of Jordan, Yah and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. We heard about the drowning of the Egyptian army and the whacking of the two kings. Voice 10 or 11. And as soon as we heard it, 40 years ago, as soon as we heard it, as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt Neither did there any remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in the earth beneath. What I'm trying to tell you is the devil knows that if you and I will march out of this place, out of Bethel, the house of God, and head straight towards that Jordan River and say, you're not going to burn us under or pull us down. He already knows that he's defeated. He's already afraid that we're going to do that. He's horrified. So how do you know, Brother John? Ask me, how do I know? Since you asked. Joshua chapter 5, voice 9. There's no point to getting a double portion if you don't know why. And the Lord said unto Joshua, this day, Joshua took over when Moses died, and the first thing he did is he circumcised all the men because nobody had been circumcised since they left Egypt. Moses was such a seeker-friendly preacher, he was afraid to cut anybody. So he had the ability to bring God's people out, but he couldn't take them in because sometimes the word of God hurts. Sometimes it cuts. Sometimes we got to bleed. Listen to what I'm telling you now. So in chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, I promise I haven't made it up, he circumcises all the men. And I'll tell you what, he didn't get the pastoral vote. I'll guarantee you... There was some complaining going on. I'm not being vulgar. I'm being real. Oh, y'all, I'm going to castrate all of you tomorrow. Come on, I'm not being vulgar. It's in the book. I'm just trying to give you an idea that sometimes leaders have to lead. 
And the Lord said unto Joshua, this day I have rolled away the approach. Why? Because of your obedience, you brought the men back into the covenant, right covenant with God. They're living in obedience to my word. Now the promised land that was theirs from the very beginning, I'm going to give it to them because I promised them from the very beginning, but I couldn't give it to them because they weren't walking in covenant. The devil didn't win. This country don't belong to him. The earth is the Lord. Wow. And the Lord said unto Joshua, this day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of this place is called what? Gilgal. Wheel. Going in a circle. You know why I took him 40 years to cross that Jordan River and get what the enemy knew they couldn't stop them from getting from day number one is they spent 40 years walking in unbelief, 40 years walking in circles of fear, 40 years of walking in a bad report. We've got some bad reports today, but I've got a good report for you today. I don't know what the rest of the world's going to do, but I know what you're going to do, and I know what I'm going to do. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. So we know now that when the prophet crosses over Gilgal, the Jordan, into Jericho like the prophet did, and then back into the old land, and then back into the promised land, was to remind the prophet that no matter what the enemy does, just as God did it then, God's going to do it now. And just like the enemy couldn't stop you then, the enemy can't stop you now. No, as, as that's why he had to go back to the Jordan and Gilgal. Now listen to this. We're for the name of the place called Gilgal. Now guys, I'm going to hurry. But this is so important. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. This is no mere man. This is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, with a sword in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Because whoever side you're on, you're going to win. He said, you've been very patient. So he sees Jesus. He gets a vision of Jesus. And where does he get this vision? He gets it at Jordan when he's about to cross over into Jericho to take the promised land as promised by the God that he served 400 plus years before. Mm. Notice the next voice. And he said, nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua, this is a word from the Lord. You, you, this is, fell on his face. That's always total surrender. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, what saith my Lord unto his servant? At that moment, although Joshua was the ruler of Israel, although Joshua had been appointed by God himself, at this moment, he totally surrenders his leadership to God. And he said, God, I don't know what to do. I'm not big enough to handle this problem. But God, I can tell that you're ready for battle. And I yield to your authority. And I surrender. Now listen, I'm going to close. Really, I'm going to close. Really, for real. But you're going to be glad I didn't close one voice or a couple. Look at the next voice. And the captain of the Lord host said unto Joshua, Loose off thy shoes from off thy foot, for the place wherein thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. God said, because now you have surrendered to me, I open up the heavens. There's angels descending and ascending. I've got my sword drawn, ready to go to battle for you. You're no longer in journey choice. You are standing on holy ground tonight for the ground which... The point of it is, he had to go from Gilgad back to the house of God to start over again where he started. Then he had to go back to the Jordan and not be pulled down by the Jordan River. And then he had to approach the, listen to me, this is from the Lord. What he got here 
was he got a vision. And the reason why the prophet, to get a double portion, had to go from Gilgad to, to back to Bethel, he had to go to where it all started in the first place, the promises, and then he had to go to Jericho because, because it was important for him to understand where it all started and where it's all going and the promises of God. And listen, and he gets there. And what does God do? This is a rhema word for the church before I knew anything about the news today. He said, all you need is a vision of me. All you need is a vision of Jesus Christ. And it always takes place at the Jordan when you're about to go in to the promised land and lay hold of your promises. Someone shout. Because Brother John ain't this smart. Several hundred years later, there's a man by the name of John, and he's baptizing folks. And you know where he's baptizing them, Brother Joey? In the Jordan River, the very same spot that the children of Israel crossed just right outside Jerusalem, and a man shows up, and his name was Jesus, but he was a man, but he's no mere man. He's the same guy that was standing there in the day of Joshua saying, I am the captain of God's army. I am the captain of the Lord of hosts. You see, Jordan, the Jordan is a place where we get a vision of Jesus Christ. I said the Jordan is a place where we get a vision of Jesus Christ. I have not changed. I am the same. I am with you, the land I... Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. The Jordan is a place of vision. And the Bible said that John the Baptist baptized John or Jesus in the river Jordan. And then when he came out, the Holy Ghost descended and lit upon him in the form of a dove. And he heard the Father say, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He gets the heavens open. He gets a vision of the Father. He gets a vision of the Holy Ghost. He gets a vision of Jesus Christ. The Jordan is the place you go when you come out of Bethel and you get a fresh vision of Jesus Christ. I've come to tell you, my friends in Eva, Alabama, that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father right now, and nothing's changed. Stand to your feet. Mm. Ooh. How many know the rest of the story? I mean, how many know the rest of the story? They blew the shofar, and then they shouted with a shout. And what happened? I said, they blew the shofar, and they shouted with a shout. And what happened? I said they blew the shofar, and they shouted with a shout. And what happened? The devil who said 40 years ago, I was shaking in my hoods because I knew the moment you stepped out of Gilgal that I was in trouble. I knew the moment you made up your mind to believe God and not the report of man that I had to give up my ground. And the devil's saying right now, I know that the moment that the body of Christ begins to shout, 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 begins to shout. Step out from where you're at and start marching to this altar. And that where you're at, you're crossing the Jordan into the promised land. But you're not going back in the bondage. You're going from bondage to the promises. And you know that the wall is going to come down because Jesus is still with you. Jesus has not changed at all. <laughs> See, Jordan 
is the place of, I need one of my ushers. Jordan. Jordan is a place of vision. Jordan is where Joshua saw Jesus, and Jordan is where John the Baptist saw Jesus, and Jordan is when the whole world got a vision of heaven and the love of the Father. And let me tell you something, there ain't enough devils from hell that she told her that. Kick off thy shoes, for the ground in which you stand is holy ground. I say unto you this night that I am the Lord. Be of good courage, be not afraid, for I am with you. I will keep, I am. You know what the devil's doing right now? For all these years, he's been saying, if the church ever figures out, that God's word is true, that God is still who he says he is, that he's still King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Every insight, take a step. I've got to surrender. Every time. Why is shouting so important? Because shouting is one of the best ways I know how to get over that thing that will pull me under. Somebody right now say, I'm not staying on this side of the Jordan. I'm going to cross over into the promised land because I've seen my God and he's still God. I said he's still God. But somebody blow a shofar. Somebody shout with a shout. Shout!